Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and assalamu alaikum. I was planning on reading this book and thought I read it with you. The book is called uh, Confessions of a British Spy. It was first published in 1868 by Waqf Ikhlas Publications and the book was written by Ayub Sabri Pasha uh, who was an Ottoman historian and writer. He studied at the Naval Academy and earned the rank of naval officer serving for a time in the Hejaz and Yemen region. He wrote historical works on the Saudi dynasty and died in 1890. With this, let's start off with the book. Needless to say, what I'm about to read is completely what's written in the book with no uh, comments of my own and the views expressed are solely of the author. Section 1, part 1. Hemphir says, "Our great Britain is very vast. The sun rises over its seas and sets again below its seas. Yet our state is relatively weak concerning its colonies in India, China and the Middle East." These countries are not entirely under our domination. However, we have been carrying on a very active and successful policy in these places. We shall be in full possession of all of them very soon. Two things are of importance. Number 1, to try to retain the places we have already obtained. Number 2, to try to take possession of those places we have not obtained yet. The Ministry of the Commonwealth assigned a commission from each of the colonies for the execution of these two tasks. As soon as I joined the Ministry of the Commonwealth, the minister put his trust in me and appointed me the administrator of our company in East India. Outwardly, it was a trade company, but its real task was to search for ways of taking control of the very vast lands of India. Our government was not at all nervous about India. India was a country where people from various nationalities speaking different languages and having contrasting interests lived together. Nor were we afraid of China, for the religions dominant in China were Buddhism and Confucianism, neither of which was much of a threat. Both of them were dead religions that instituted no concern for life and which were no more than forms of addresses. For this reason the people living in these two countries were hardly likely to have any feelings of patriotism these two countries did not worry us the british government yet the events that might occur later were not out of consideration for us therefore we were designing long term plans to wage discord ignorance poverty and even diseases in these countries We were imitating the customs and traditions of these two countries thus easily concealing our intentions. What frazzled our nerves most was the Islamic countries. We had already made some agreements all of which were to our advantage with the sick man uh, meaning the Ottoman Empire. Experienced members of the Ministry of the Commonwealth predicted that this sick man would pass away in less than a century. In addition, we had made some secret agreements with the Iranian government and placed in these two countries statesmen whom we had made masons. Such corruptions as bribery, incompetent administration, and inadequate religious education, which in its turn led to being occupied with pretty women and consequently to neglect of duty, broke the backbones of these two countries. In spite of all these we were anxious that our activities would not yield the results we expected for reasons I'm going to cite below. Number 1, Muslims are extremely devoted to Islam. Every individual Muslim is as strongly attached to Islam as a priest or monk to Christianity, if not more. As it is known, priests and monks would rather die than give up Christianity. The most dangerous of such people are the Shias in Iran. for they put down people who are not shias as disbelievers and foul christians are like noxious dirt according to shias naturally one would do one's best to get rid of dirt i once asked a shia this why do you look on christians as such the answer i was given was this the prophet of islam was a very wise person he put christians under a spiritual oppression in order to make them find the right way by joining allah's religion islam as a matter of fact it is a state policy to keep a person found dangerous under a spiritual oppression until he pledges obedience the dirt i'm speaking about is not material it is a spiritual oppression which is not peculiar to christians alone it involves sunnis and all disbelievers even our ancient magian iranian ancestors are foul according to shias
I said to him, Well, Sunnis and Christians believe in Allah, in Prophets, and in the Judgment Day too. Why should they be foul then? He replied, They are foul for two reasons. They impute mendacity to our Prophet Muhammad, may Allah protect us against such an act. And we, in response to this atrocious imputation, follow the rule expressed in the saying, If a person torments you, you can torment him in return. And say to them, You are foul. Secondly, Christians make offensive allegations about the prophets of Allah. For instance, they say, Isa, Jesus, السلام, drank alcohol. Because he was accursed, he was crucified. In consternation, I said to the man that Christians did not say so. Yes, they do, was the answer. And you don't know, it is written so and so in the Holy Bible. I became quiet. For the man was right in the first respect, if not in the second respect. I did not want to continue the dispute any longer. Number 2. Islam was once a religion of administration and authority, and Muslims were respected. It would be difficult to tell these respectable people that they were slaves now. Nor would it be possible to falsify the Islamic history and say to Muslims, the honor and respect you obtained at one time was the result of some favorable conditions. Those days are gone now, and they will never come back. Number 3. We were very anxious that the Ottomans and Iranians might notice our plots and foil them, despite the fact that these two states had already been debilitated considerably. We still did not feel certain because they had a central government with property, weaponry and authority. Number 4. We were extremely uneasy about Islamic scholars. For the scholars of Istanbul and Al-Azhar and the Iraqi and Damascene scholars were insurmountable obstacles against our objectives. For they were the kind of people who would never compromise their principles to the tiniest extent because they had turned against the transient pleasures and adornments of the world and fixed their eyes on the paradise promised by Quran al Karim. The people followed them, even the Sultan was afraid of them. Sunnis were not so strongly adherent to scholars as were Shias. For Shias did not read books, they only recognized scholars and did not show due respect to the Sultan. Sunnis, on the other hand, read books and respected scholars and the Sultan. We therefore prepared a series of conferences. Yet each time we tried, we saw with disappointment that the road was closed for us. The reports we received from our spies were always frustrating and the conferences came to naught. We did not give up hope though, for we are the sort of people who have developed the habit of taking a deep breath and being patient. The minister himself, the highest priestly orders and a few specialists attended one of our conferences. There were 20 of us. Our conference lasted three hours and the final session was closed without reaching a fruitful conclusion. Yet a priest said, do not worry, for the Messiah and his companions obtained authority only after a persecution that lasted 300 years. It is hoped that from the world of the unknown, he will cast an eye on us and grant us the good luck of evicting the unbelievers, he means Muslims, from their centers, be it 300 years later. With a strong belief and long-term patience, we must arm ourselves. In order to obtain authority, we must take possession of all sorts of media, try all possible methods. We must try to spread Christianity among Muslims. It will be good for us to realize our goal, even if it will be after centuries. For fathers work for their children. A conference was held, and diplomats and religious men from Russia and France, as well as from England, attended. I was very lucky. I too attended because I and the minister were in very good terms. In the conference, plans of breaking Muslims into groups and making them abandon their faith and bringing them round to belief, Christianizing them, like in Spain, were discussed. Yet the conclusions reached were not as had been expected. I have written about all the talks held in that conference in my book, Ira Malakutul Masih. It is difficult to suddenly uproot a tree that has sent out its roots to the depths of the earth. But we must make hardships easy and overcome them. Christianity came to spread. Our Lord the Messiah promised us this. The bad conditions that the East and the West were in helped Muhammad. Those conditions being gone have taken away the nuisances he means Islam, that accompanied them. We observe with pleasure today that the situation has changed completely. 
As a result of the great works and endeavors of our ministry and other Christian governments, Muslims are on the decline now. Christians, on the other hand, are gaining ascendancy. It is time we retook the places we lost throughout the centuries. The powerful state of Great Britain pioneers this blessed task of annihilating Islam.